uh, First Regular Chapel following our convocation. Glad that you're, you're here with us. Tyler Ivey, who's uh, one of our uh, students who will be graduating in May, is assisting with, with chapel and part of the service uh, later this morning as well. Uh, make sure you have the order for chapel as well as the page with the two songs, uh, two of the songs that we'll be singing. Uh, as most of you know, those will be available week to week out front. Uh, we'll try to have uh, people handing those out, but if not, they'll be on tables there for you. Um, this, this semester, uh, we're going to follow a theme for most of our chapels. We'll have variations here and there based on different speakers. Uh, But the focus will be on the Holy Spirit, Lord, and giver of life. If you recall, if you've been a student here over the past couple of years, we've followed a particular uh, focus in chapel last spring, Jesus, the friend of sinners. We thought it would be appropriate to follow that up, uh, focusing on the Holy Spirit, his person, and his work. Again, uh, that will be the primary theme, though there'll be variations at various points through the semester. Um, Obviously, a number of things are getting started uh, beyond classes. Uh, One of those today is your student prayer groups led by faculty members that uh, meet directly after chapel, 12, 1230. Uh, Want to encourage you to attend. You should have received an email uh, about your group and where that group meets. If you did not, feel free to email me and we'll make sure we get you that information. I uh, would want you to be a part of those groups. It's also the uh, today, as you've seen in Brute Facts, maybe elsewhere, is uh, the President's Day of Prayer, where we have unique times during the day for prayer. And one of those times is going to be immediately following our in-person prayer groups with fellow students uh, with a Zoom meeting. And what that allows us to do is to have people outside of our immediate community join in. Um, even our graduates from other places in the world. And it's a great encouragement to them. Uh, So not only is our participation for our own encouragement, for the encouragement of others, and we also get to hear something about their work so that we might pray for them. Uh, As you know, Westminster's purpose is to train specialists in the Bible to proclaim God's whole counsel for Christ and his global church. And we want you to be aware of how we're connected to that global work of Christ through our graduates. And it's an opportunity to pray for them. So as you have opportunity, I'd really encourage you to join uh, at 1230. Um, uh, The Zoom link was sent out yesterday in an email. Uh, You'll receive another email a little bit later this afternoon about another opportunity at 3 p.m. as well to join in prayer. Avail yourself uh, to those opportunities. Uh, Let me also say this briefly before we begin. By now, you know, have some sense of the work that's before you this semester. You've calculated the amount of reading on your uh, syllabi, uh, thought about all the work that that there is to do. Uh, But I want to encourage us as a community to remember that uh, your chief end uh, is not your studies, but to glorify and enjoy God forever. Uh, Surely that should be uh, the result of our work here at Westminster, shouldn't it be, Uh, that we would be drawn to glorify him all the more, uh, to sing his praises. And chapel is an opportunity for us to do that together, Uh, that we would be drawn here because of all the things we've studied, all the things that we're learning, that we might sing his praise, uh, followed by a time of prayer with your fellow students and faculty. Uh, So please, again, avail yourself to those opportunities uh, that our work here might bear fruit and worship. Uh, Unto that end, you'll note in your order of worship the call to worship from Psalm 148, just two verses of this great psalm that calls for this cosmic chorus of praise, if you're familiar with Psalm 148, calling forth praise from the heavens calling forth praise from the earth and all that fills them, a chorus of cosmic praise that rebounds throughout creation. And we this morning are joining our voices to that praise. And so stand and let me read for us this call to worship from Psalm 148, verses 11 and 12. And then I'll pray for us and then we'll sing together. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. 
For his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Let's pray. Our God, may we joyfully lift our voices to glorify your name. Yet we confess that we have lived for the praise of much lesser things. Uh, Rather than praising you in all things as our creator, uh, we exalt things of your creation. Uh, But you are merciful and gracious. You are slow to anger. You are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You yourself have promised to restore the order of your creation and place once again your praise in our mouths. And you have begun this work already in our lives through Christ Jesus. And we pray that you would bring it to completion for your glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, Let's sing together from our Trinity hymnals, page 660. O God beyond all praising. Our scripture reading will be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning in verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. As we affirm and confess our faith, please stand. We will read from the Heidelberg Catechism, 
question and answer one. I will read the question and you will respond with the answer. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing, ready from now on to live for him. Please remain standing as we sing My Only Comfort. This morning, I would ask you to turn with me in the scriptures 
to Paul's epistle to the Galatians. As you know, Galatians has been called the Magna Carta of Christianity. Uh, Romans is the great epistle of justification, and this epistle is a parallel emphasis on the wonderful truth of justification by faith alone. Please hear the reading of God's Word as we turn specifically to Galatians chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 15, and I'll read through verse 21. Hear then God's Word. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose." Thus far, the reading of God's Word. Join me as we pray for a moment. Lord, you are the source of all truth. You have given us your Word. We are brought by your great mercy to the saving Christ Jesus, the Lord, who justifies sinners by his life, death, and resurrection and ascension. We thank you for sending forth your Holy Spirit, who inspired the Word, who has regenerated our hearts, and we pray now would illumine our minds so that your word might be written upon our hearts for our spiritual good and for your glory. We thank you that we can turn to you, and we pray now that you'd speak to us by your great mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As we turn to this text, then, we are dealing with the theological concept of justification. Justification, as you know, is a forensic term, a term that comes from the courtroom, It is that moment when a judge looks at someone and says, not guilty. What a great declaration of righteousness. And of course, this makes no sense when we think of it being applied to those who are guilty. And so the Christian doctrine of justification tells us that we are declared righteous, not because we are righteous, but because the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is credited to our account. It has been imputed to us. It is his perfect life and death and his suffering in our place that was absolutely pristine before the holy gaze of Almighty God the Father. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And his perfect life becomes ours. And as Luther once said it, we receive it by reaching out a beggar's hand to receive a gift from a king. This is not what we have done. And so we boldly and unashamedly declare that the Scriptures say the only instrument that God uses to bring righteousness to sinners is faith. And thus we can say boldly, we are justified by faith alone. There's no other means that we can have this wonderful right standing before God than justification. This is the burden that the great apostle Paul is concerned to bring to the church in Galatia. And of course, our Reformation forefathers said things like these. Luther, the doctrine of justification is the article of the standing or falling church. It's Luther who said justification is the hinge on which all of our salvation turns. Here, the apostle Paul is declaring that Jews and Gentiles alike are only able to be right with God by the gift of righteousness through faith in Christ. Not by what they've done, not by the works of the law. 
This, of course, in its great context was that scene when Peter was enjoying fellowship with Gentile believers. And then some of the folks who were Judaizing in tendency came from Jerusalem. And they said, Peter, what are you doing? You are violating the kosher laws of a godly Christian. You have to separate from them. And Peter said, you're right, I need to separate. Can you imagine this? This young upstart apostle Paul said, Peter, you're wrong. He said, I blamed him to the face because the gospel was on the line. My goodness, what a scene. Well, that's the context in which Paul tells us we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. It's the attitude of the Orthodox Jewish person, the Judaizers in the Christian faith. We're not Gentiles. We're part of the real covenant by birth lines as well as religious life and practice with Abraham and Moses. But he says, yet we know that as believers, as those who receive the gospel, we are not going to be justified by our works. We'll not be declared righteous before God by what we've done. Rather, we are justified by this wonderful gift of God in Jesus Christ. Now, that great truth is echoing in Paul's mind because it has a natural objection. Then what happens to obedience? What happens to the law? Why worry about it if you already got yourself home free? You won the lottery every day the rest of your life before God. Do what you want, right? Well, you can hear the hint of that concern when he says in our passage, uh, is Christ then becoming the servant of sin? Is Christ helping us to do wrong things? Paul will say it in Romans 6, shall we sin that grace may abound? And in both cases, there's an emphatic, no, you don't understand. Justification, this great work, is connected with Jesus Christ himself. You cannot have justification as a concept, a mere forensic declaration, some kind of legal fiction. It is something that happens in union with the crucified and risen Christ. And that's what Paul is going to try to teach us in our passage today. We're going to look quickly at four Simple points from verses 19 and 20. First of all, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's spiritual obituary. Secondly, we're going to consider Paul's spiritual resurrection. Thirdly, we're going to consider Paul's daily reality. And then fourthly, we'll consider Paul's spiritual lifeline. I'm sorry, a four-point sermon, and they are not alliterated, but they do begin with the same first two words. So if you're critiquing my sermon, be gracious. It's the first one of the semester after all. Okay. All right, so as you begin, notice that Paul will say very clearly as we look at our key verse, verse 19, for through the law I died to the law. Paul says the law did its work. The law kills those that do not keep its standard. And no one can keep its standard unless they're utterly perfect. The Lord Jesus said, you must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you would have the great reward of the law, which is life through obedience, then you better never fail in thought, word, and deed. Paul said the law has been successful in its task. It's shown me my sin so much that it's destroyed me. I have died. The law has done its work. I don't know if you remember that famous television comic, George Burns. Some of you are so young. He, he died before you were born. He died in 1996. But for 70 years, he was regularly chomping on his stogie and cracking one-liners. And he lived to be 100. People were beginning to say, will it be this year that George Burns dies or not? He made it to 100. But one of his great lines was, I get up every morning and read the obituary column. If my name's not there, I eat breakfast. 
And I'm beginning to resemble that remark, I tell you, you know, the more gray hair, I, I can't get any more gray hair, it's just starting to fall out. I'm so glad for that first question, not a hair from my head can fall out apart from the will of God. So I'm, I'm starting to count them every morning, another one's falling out. The point is, the obituary comes for everyone in life. It will come. But Paul is not talking about our earthly death. He's saying that every one of us who are going to follow Jesus Christ have to look at our lives and say, I died. What was the goal of my life? What was the measure of my success? How I measured my self-esteem? What made me think I had prominence and importance for others? It must die. Because that is my treadmill, my works righteousness, my achieving the trophies of this world to get fame and success. I died by the law because I realized no matter what I could do, I never could keep its full standard. And so as we look at this verse, Paul tells us in an autobiographical way that this is the way a Christian should think of himself. Can you say in your life, in your spiritual life, I have an obituary. I've died to the worldly measure of success of what makes me think I'm significant. My identity and my purpose in life is not measured by myself. I've died. I have an entirely different reference in which I will live my life. And so Paul says here in verse 19, for through the law I died to the law. That method is no longer how I'm dealing with my life. Instead, he said, I died with a purpose. There was a reason for my death. You notice that phrase, in order that or so that? My death was a conscious death, and it had a purpose. Why? So that I might live to God. It's kind of like someone who's traveling with all of his heart to go east and one day he says, I'm not going east. Forget the east. I'm going west. The east is now dead to him, and he's just traveling this way. An entire about face in a whole new direction. Paul said, I died to what my life was, and I've had an about face. I died, why? Because my reference is no longer myself or my tradition or my keeping the law. It's to live to God. And some of you who have studied theologically remember the Puritan William Ames. He defined theology as theozoia, living to God. Theology and practice are inseparable in a true biblical sense. You die to live for God. You have a new focus, a true theological end. And as we consider this idea, I have an obituary, and it has a purpose. It is a purpose of rejecting my own standard and measure. It is now something entirely different to live to God. And Paul explains that this living to God requires an understanding of a certain way of dying. You have to die a certain way if you have this obituary. I have been crucified with Christ. The original actually puts Christ first. With Christ, I have been crucified. He's the one in whom I've died. In fact, it's amazing as you think about the cross, uh, there are various realities of the cross that sometimes we forget. Of course, Jesus died on the cross. He was nailed to the cross. But what else was nailed to the cross? It was the sign over the top that said, here is the king of the Jews in different languages. But more than that was nailed to the cross. Colossians 3 will tell us, the curse of judgment against us for breaking our sin was nailed to the cross. That too is there. But there's yet more. Paul says, I was nailed to the cross. And he'll go on in Galatians 6 to say there's even more nailed to the cross. The world has been nailed to the cross. What an extraordinary idea. That cross is a busy place in Paul's theology. Christ is crucified. The rejection and mockery is placed upon it. But our condemnation and guilt is crucified there. And so are we and our relationship to the world. 
Do you have an obituary like that? Are you like Luther said in his Galatian commentary, by faith you are so cemented to Christ that he and you are as one person which cannot be separated but remains attached to him forever. Your obituary is that you have died to everything so much so that you are now on the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is an extraordinary concept. Our Theological forefathers have called it union with Christ. John Murray put it this way, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. This is the heart of what binds us all together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all crucified with Jesus on the cross. Now, union with Christ has its eternal pretemporal form. It has its current Heavenly form, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. But here Paul wants us to understand that the great Christ event, this act of history, is a spiritual reality that includes us by God's sovereign purpose. We are crucified with Christ. Calvin in his Institutes, in his third book, first chapter, first paragraph, says... We must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. Do you have an obituary in your spiritual life where you've abandoned all hope of your self-focus and your accomplishments and your credibility and your success before God and man to say, no, I had a purposeful death to live to God. And it begins by my coming to the cross and seeing Jesus there, but seeing myself there. My life is dead in Christ. I've died with him. He is my Savior. We might think here, as uh, P.T. Forsyth once put it, of the cruciality of the cross. Isn't that a clever title? The cross-likeness of the cross. Crucial. Cross-like. And you begin to think of Paul. He believed in the cruciality of the cross. He boasted about the cross in Galatians 2.19. I have been crucified with Christ. We'll look at that shortly. In Galatians 3.1, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified in his ministry. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified. In 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He wrote of the message of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the offense of the cross in Galatians 5.11, the triumph of the cross in Colossians 2.15, and the wonder of the cross in Philippians 2.8. Is the cruciality of the cross the very essence of your spiritual obituary? Now, as we look again at this marvelous verse, as Paul is saying, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. He says, there's still a life in this world, even though I have had this decisive death to my own purpose in life to live for God by crucifixion with Christ. He said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now, we don't want to make too much about this, but it is significant in the original language. The word for I, you all know it, is ego. Anybody who would be willing to identify themselves as egoists? You don't have to. You all are, and I am too. We all love the big me, myself, and I. Ego is the nominative form of I. It's I. It's the one who acts. When Paul says, I am, have been crucified with Christ, that's the ego. He says now, but it's no longer I who live, ego. From this point on, the word ego disappears. Instead, you know, the Greek verb has the person contained within it. And so he doesn't want to use the word I anymore. Once he begins to realize the I has died, it's not about what I'm doing. 
Instead, he moves from subject to object. He is now one who's being acted upon by the sovereign grace of God. It's now me. When you say me, you say, this is coming at me. It's not what I'm doing. I am receiving. And so Paul says, it is no longer I. My ego is going to end right here and now. It's not about me. And what's fascinating when that word is used no longer, it's a remarkable word. In the Septuagint, it's the word that you find in Exodus 5-7 when Pharaoh says to Moses, there will no longer be straw provided. This is decisive. You're on your own. It's what Jesus uses in Matthew 19.6. You are no longer two, but one in the marriage word. I love it in Philemon 1.6. He's no longer a bondservant, but a beloved brother. This is a word of a decisive, final change. And so what we see here is the Lord Jesus Christ having received us as those that are crucified with him. We have decided forever to end the self-focus of ourselves because of our union with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is I that no longer who lives. We could pause and just reflect on this practically for the rest of our time together. What applications might come? We live in a day where identity is everything. My gender, my politics, my ethnicity, my denomination, my name and legacy, all gone for Paul. And it should be for you. Oh, the world wants to swallow up and shape us into its form and say, identify yourself in this expressive individualism where you become who you are and make everybody kowtow to your identity. That is alien and hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not about I. It's all about Christ who has blessed me and you. Is that the attitude you bring to your relationships and to your understanding of yourself? It is the gospel. This is Paul's teaching. It's bold, it's clear, it's powerful, and it rejects the very approach that we are inundated with in our day. It is no longer I who live. Yes, do you have a spiritual obituary? So secondly, do you have a spiritual resurrection? But Christ who lives in me, but Christ who lives in me, Christ, the Messiah, the one sent to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament, the anointed one to be prophet, priest, and king for God's people. Paul says in this passage that I have a supernatural reality in my life. Number one. The Christ who is crucified, he's not dead. He's alive. He's not only alive and ascended and seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, interceding for me. He actually has come to dwell in me. Do you have, along with your spiritual description of your death, a spiritual resurrection of Christ within you. It's wonderful that we move from the past tense to the present tense in this next section. I died. I now live. He lives in me. This is my ongoing reality. This is who I am. J. Gresham Machen, in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, it's its 100th anniversary this year, as you undoubtedly know, he will come to Galatians 2.20 and he will say, this is one of the most stupendous verses on the Christian life. You know, Machen is uh, known for exaggeration. You know, the, stu the word stupendous means you're so shocked, you're stunned, you don't even know what to say. It's kind of like when Michael Tyson punches you in the nose. Oh, that's what happened. He says, I hit this, I don't know what to think about it. He says, this is the supernatural experience of the Christian. The risen Christ is 
living in us. This is our life. It is no longer I, I'm gone, but now I have a spiritual testimony of resurrection life. Paul had a spiritual obituary and he had a spiritual resurrection to go with it. Is that the reality of our lives? Christ who lives in me. Now there's so much more we could say about all of this, but I think the key thing that we want to have here, again, is that idea of union with Christ. This would be a wonderful time to look at John 14, 23, or John 17, 23, where Jesus will say, I in them and you in me. Jesus is going to the cross in that verse, and he said, Father, I'm going to be in them. Remember, he's, Jesus prayed for three groups, and the group that he prayed at the end was for those that would believe through the apostles. This is his prayer for you. I in them. I'm praying that I will be in them. And when I come into them, Lord, you're going to be in me as I am in them. The dwelling place of the triune God in history is us and our individual relationship with God. <clears throat> the cruciality of the cross brings us to the dynamic of the resurrection. And so it is that this verse is not only stupendous, it's like J.A. Bengel said, the great Lutheran theologian commentator in the 1700s, this is the very marrow of Christianity. This is the lifeblood of what it means to be a Christian. Jesus is in me. Christ lives in me. It's not a bare emotional experience. It is not a theological aphorism, but a supernatural reality to claim and to identify with. And Paul is saying this autobiographical sketch is for those that know Jesus Christ. We are to have a spiritual obituary that recognizes the cruciality of the cross. We're to have a spiritual resurrection that sees in the Lord Jesus our union with him. But we also have to deal with the spiritual daily reality of our lives. As we look at this verse, it's very interesting. Notice how Paul goes on to say as he addresses his life right now, and the life I now live in the flesh. The Lord doesn't catch us up to the third heaven when we believe. We still are in this broken world. We're still in this body of flesh. We are still struggling with the reality of day-to-day -day sin and temptation and failure. And in fact, that's one of the objections that uh, can be brought against uh, justification. You look at chapter 2 and verse 17. If you really believe this justification, you're just going to keep on sinning because, look, we're still in this world. We are broken people. In fact, we recognize that there are all sorts of deeds of the flesh that we have to deal with. If you look quickly at Galatians chapter 5 and verses 19 to 21, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the life that I now live in the flesh. Isn't that interesting? The concatenation of having died with Christ, having been raised with Christ and being united with him, does not take us out of the struggle and the rough and tumble of this world. The temptation, the brokenness, the failure, the hurt all around us, and yes, within us. And so how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, we need to look carefully again at the fact that Paul does not teach us a sinless perfection. He tells us that we have this wonderful union with Christ, but the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. By the way, those eyes are not in the original. Remember, the eye is suppressed. He's now living as a man who sees himself in union with Christ. He's living in light of the cross and the resurrection. 
And so the key part of Paul's understanding is that I now live in the flesh, but I don't live by the law. I don't live by myself. I don't live by my merit. I don't live by my self-confidence. I don't live on my laurels. I don't live on all that I know I can accomplish. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What we see in these words is Paul's recognizing the spiritual daily reality of the struggle of our fallenness joined at the same time with our being redeemed. How do we put them together? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that this is the work then of the Holy Spirit. This is the work where the Holy Spirit begins to help us because we live in union with Christ. Jesus is the sender, the giver of the Spirit. So if we look back at that section that we read earlier in Galatians 5 where it has all the things that the flesh will draw us to, I, but I live by faith. I live in union with Christ, crucified and risen. I have the ability to do all these terrible things. What do I do? Verse 22 and following, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Remember, we're crucified with Christ. But there is now a daily reality to say, Lord, I've got to come back to to the cross. That old self wants to get up and say, hey, look at me. I want to put the ego back in my life instead of letting it be subjected to Christ. Paul will say, I die daily. This is the mortification of sin that has to be part of every Christian life. We have the reality of union with Christ and the struggle with sin. How will we deal with this daily spiritual reality? It's remembering that we have this union with Christ that helps us to live for him. You know, there's an old story that's been told about a southern gentleman who had two dogs that liked to fight, and the question was, well, which dog wins? And the statement was, well, the one I feed. The one that has the energy is the one that has the power. That is the daily walk with Christ. It's dwelling in his word, daily repentance, renewing our faith. And so Paul will say in this passage, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, it is very much a real world. But now I have a spiritual life. I have a spiritual life that will have the ability to keep me strong. I have a spiritual lifeline. And what, does it, what is it? I now live in the flesh, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What Paul is saying in this concluding section is that our spiritual life is the only way that we will survive and walk with God. It is not, again, about all that you've accomplished, all that you've done. It's so easy for us to begin to say, I blew it. I'm going to show people I'm really good after all. I'm going to demonstrate myself. It all begins by coming back and say, how do I lift up Jesus? He's the one that matters in my I live by faith in the Son of God. It is my faith in Christ that gives me hope that I can overcome my failures, my sin, my disappointments. This one now is no longer called the Christ. Notice, I live by faith in the Son of God. He is the second person of the triune God. The one who's the Messiah who suffered is the one who's God himself. I have God as my object of faith. And more than that, he loved me. He is one who's dedicated his very lifeblood that I might be forgiven. My union with Christ gives me a, a refreshment again and again when I come to the cross. He loved me and gave himself for me. So the question that we have to ask here is what are you depending on as you go through your Christian life? 
I know this very well. It's easy to say, well, hey, look, I have a PhD. Hey, look, I've been ordained. Hey, look, I, I've been married for 50 years now. That's no small feat, by the way, especially when you realize all the struggles that come in 50 years of marriage. But you know what? That's not my identity. That's not what makes me have strength. I have union with Christ. I have my connection with his person and his work. His person, who is he? He is, in fact, the Son of God. What is his work? He gave himself for me. The cross is the most personal thing in the world for Paul. Jesus died for him. And that's what we have to come to grips with. Our union with Christ brings us back to the cross. Notice Paul's righteousness is not found in the fact, since I died on the cross, I must be a pretty good person. No, Christ is the one who died for him. He's united to the Savior that makes him right. So Paul concludes this passage by putting it this way. I do not nullify the grace of God. Isn't that interesting? Paul says it's possible for people who are around Christian things to make this wonderful gift of grace that comes from God to us in Christ irrelevant or useless. How does that happen? Number one, it happens when we begin to say to ourselves, I'm very much alive. Look what I can do. Look at my accomplishments. I've gone to college. I'm at seminary, gotten great grades. I'm married, have a happy family, made a lot of money in the stock market. Have you written your obituary? I've died. Secondly, do you see that your success in ministry and in Christian life is because you've been raised to life in Christ? It's Christ in you. Have you seen that you are never home free until you get to your true home, which is heaven itself, which means you can go a long way and still slip in a mud puddle and fall? You aren't there yet which means every day we have a duty to say, am I walking close to Christ, not relying in my flesh? Yes, we all can sin at any stage of our lives and bring shame and guilt. The daily reality of walking with the Lord is saying, it's not me. It's Christ living in me. I must die to myself and live to Christ moment by moment. And then ultimately, I'm looking forward to the fact that there's this wonderful lifeline that God gives to me. That is my union with Christ that I have by faith because he is the son of God who loved me and he's given himself for me. As we conclude, I think what I'd like to do is just share a, a couple final verses that might be useful for us. Listen at Romans chapter 8 as Paul takes this same truth and now adds the work of the Holy Spirit to it. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What Paul has been describing in these verses is the work of the Holy Spirit that accompanies inseparably the work of justification. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5.17, we are a new creation created in Christ Jesus. And so that new creation comes about by union. So as we finish our thoughts today, I'm wondering if you hear Paul's words that say, I do not nullify the grace of God. How do you nullify the grace of God? By turning from your union with Christ and his death and resurrection, your utter dependence upon him, and the privilege that we have to bear his cross, putting to death our sin. Sanctification then is inseparable from justification. Our union with Christ brings a new life, 
of Christ-centered faith. May God help us to that end, and let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open this portion of your word. We ask that you might give us wisdom to see the great grace that you have for us, that we would see your Holy Spirit coming through the cross as the only hope that we have of being right with you in our day-by-day life. May the wonder of the cross, the triumph of the cross, ever be on our hearts and the message of the cross be what we preach, even if it brings offense to the world. Let us decide to know nothing among any except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Let's stand now to sing from the handout, Law, Gospel, Doxology. God's perfect law exposes me. I feel my sin and desperate.